Hey everybody, it's Rebecca. I am back for another episode of the Monday Mr. Money Mustache Motivation. But before we get into that, a couple orders of business. <clears throat> Number one, if I sound really crappy, it is because I'm battling a cold right now. And I'm really struggling because I never get sick. Um, my husband and I, this coming April, we will have been together for four years. And <clears throat> he was just saying yesterday about how he's never seen me sick. And I think he's probably right. I hardly ever catch a cold. So anyway, I've got a cough drop. I'm going to try to get through this post without too much sniffles or coughing. So bear with me for this one, y'all. And um, second order of business is I started an Instagram page uh, and I will link it in the description box below. So feel free to follow me on Instagram. Um, I have no idea how Instagram works. I didn't have a personal Instagram page. I had never been on there until I created um, this Quest to Fire page uh, a couple days ago. So bear with me on there because I'll be learning how that works as I go, much like YouTube. I just kind of started this YouTube um, channel after, you know, watching all these other financial channels that were inspiring to me. So I'm sort of learning YouTube as I go along and, you know, I'll be learning Instagram as I go along too. So if you're on Instagram, then give me a follow. <clears throat> all right. So for this episode 14 of the Monday Mr. Money Mustache Motivation, this blog post that I'm reading from comes from April 29th, 2011, Living Well on the Trailing Edge of Luxury. And as always, I will link this blog post below as well. <clears throat> the only constant in the world is change. That old quote is amazing because it's so true no matter how deeply you think about it. What is even deeper is that it is credited to a guy in 500 BC, back when things were changing almost unfathomably slower than they are right now. Let's review a little North American history to be even more amazed. For thousands of years, the natives of this continent lived a pretty constant lifestyle. Hunting, skins, lots of cool techniques and tools, but only very small changes over hundreds of years. In the 1500s, the Europeans started pushing their way in, bringing their farming and somewhat more complicated industry. It took only 300 years to get to the point of making things such as steam engines in the 1800s. From 1900 to the 1950s, people were shocked at the advancements of things like cars, television, and washing machines. Technological change was much faster than that of the 1800s, but it still seems slow to us by today's standards. 30 years later in the 1980s, televisions and washing machines were still pretty clunky. In the 1980s, a few people got computers. In 1993, the internet started to catch on. In 1999, everyone had several computers and internet access. And cell phones had monochrome screens. In 2007, the Apple iPhone 1 stunned the technology world by taking everything previously invented and putting it in one sleek touchscreen tablet. In 2011, we are on our fourth version of the iPhone, which makes the third version from 2009 look like a hopeless caveman relic. Yet even the iPhone 4 is only months from being obsolete when the iPhone 5 comes out. This long introduction is not the most concise way to get to my point, but it's fun to remind you of this trend of acceleration so you can use it to your advantage. You see, we humans are actually not very good at noticing accelerating trends. Maybe because all of our evolutionary history was spent in times of very slow social change. So if you ask an average modern person about what things will be like 10 years in the future, they will look back 10 years in their life, estimate the amount of change that has happened in that time, and tack on that amount of change to the present world to guess what the future will be like. <clears throat> They will totally miss the exponential rate of change, which means the future will surprise them. I like to have a chuckle occasionally at the peak oil movement's projection of future oil demand. These people say, well, our oil consumption doubled over the last 10 years, so in future decades we'll double again and again, and AUG will all die when there is a huge shortage in the year 2040. What they are missing is things like the acceleration of the solar panel, scientific novelty in 1954, 
widespread on every kid's calculator in 1990. Expensive but powerful system to power a house in 2000. Affordable and widespread on millions of rooftops in the southwest U.S. in 2011. Dirt cheap and the only way anyone gets power for anything in the exponentially near future. And even my prediction will quickly sound hokey and old-fashioned because I can't predict what unforeseen things will be invented in the next few decades. And now, finally, getting back to the point for our students. Because of this exponential change, our world is awash in almost new consumer products. The hottest ones are in the stores, and the hottest ones from just a few months ago are abandoned in people's drawers and garages. You almost never need to buy anything new because you can have an almost new item for 25-50% to 50 of the cost out of one of these drawers. People are so accustomed to buying new things that they are willing to almost give away their used things even when they are barely used. In the 1980s, this type of shopping would be less fun. People kept their fridges until the handles fell off, and their Sony cassette Walkmans weren't obsolete until years after they were bought and they started eating tapes. You'd replace it with a slightly smaller cassette Walkman that had been upgraded to include red plastic instead of black. Cars had shorter, more maintenance-intensive lifespans, and there was no Craigslist, so moving used goods was a costly and time-consuming thing to attempt. <clears throat> but today, and increasingly so in the future, we have reached a point where a rational consumer should see very little difference between new and used things, and you, rational consumer, should be, bu should be buying very little new product. I actually value used items more than new ones because I like the idea that I prevented one new item from being manufactured in some toxic factory in Beijing. In the grocery store, we willingly pay more for organic, green, and recycled things, but buying a used car or fridge or shirt is actually cheaper than a new one, even though it is much more friendly to the earth. I admit that I still buy new things occasionally, but only after working through this set of steps, which you can adopt too. Step number one, <clears throat> feel desire to purchase a new product. Man, I sure want a minivan for my construction business. Step two, analyze why you want the product and if it would actually make you happier given you're already lacking free time. I want the van because it'll help me carry more tools and make me efficient and I could use it for family vacations too. Step three, try to shoot holes in your analysis. I already have a borrowed, rusty 1984 Nissan pickup truck that carries the tools just fine. Besides, if I buy a van, it will drain away the very money that I've been trying to earn. I'll have to work more just to have this work van. Step four, try to delay purchasing the product until after several milestones. Okay, I do need the van eventually because the truck is taking me hours each week to load and unload due to limited capacity. But I'll wait until after the new year, maybe even until spring, since I won't be working much in the winter anyway. Step number five. If the desire to purchase persists, start shopping for the item on Craigslist. Find the best deal, and only once you have enough cash on hand to buy it with no loans and without compromising any of your other money goals, go ahead and buy it. Step six. <clears throat> If no suitable items come up on Craigslist after several weeks slash months of searching, you may consider buying it new. When I first wrote this article in October 2010, I was still not quite to step five with the van, and I would never get to step number six since there are plenty on Craigslist. But in February 2011, I eventually did make the purchase, and I was content knowing that I got what was somebody's $32,000 dream luxury van in 1999, and is really amazingly close to being as useful as a 2011 van for the pocket change amount of $4,800. <clears throat> That's life on the trailing edge. Yeah, he um, brings up a lot of valid points in this article. And again, you know, my ears were burning reading this because I'm guilty of wanting the newest thing. Um, if you don't believe that people are willing to um, trade slightly used, almost new items for next to nothing, then go check out the Financial Wolf's channel. He has a huge, huge side hustle flipping old phones. And he makes a lot of money doing it, too. And I should add that he's only 16 years old and he's making a killing. Um, 
And you know, y'all know that uh, I just recently bought a new phone. Um, and I did consider buying an older model iPhone. Um, I had an iPhone 6 and it was only a 16 gigabyte and was starting to give me issues as far as being able to record videos and upload them on YouTube because I didn't have the memory anymore. So I did consider buying an older uh, model iPhone, but um, the older models um, that were on the carrier that I use, I use Straight Talk. Even an iPhone um, 7 or 8, they were still a good few hundred dollars. And since I've got this Scotland trip coming up later in September, I decided I really wanted the best camera I could get. So I did go ahead and get a new one. Um, and this is actually one purchase that I don't regret. Um, you know, I did what I could to reduce the cost uh, out of my pocket to get it. And this is another item that, you know, I'll use until it won't work anymore. Um, you know, I did that with my iPhone 6. I had it for years. Um, but largely, you know, this article is true. Anytime you buy something new, you do need to consider the opportunity cost of purchasing that new item. A couple things I do regret buying. Um, well, one big one is my new car that I have. Uh, the newness wears off quickly, y'all. Um, whenever you get something new, it doesn't take long for that hedonic adaptation to kick in. You get used to having it, and all of a sudden, that new feeling is gone. Um, you know, my car, I like my car, but should I have bought it new? Absolutely not. Um, I'm upside down on what that car is worth, and now because I have all this other debt I'm trying to pay off, I'm stuck with car payments for a while. And because I'm stuck with car payments for a while, I'm not able to um, invest as heavily as I would like. I'm not able to get my savings rate up as high as I would like because I'm spreading myself too thin with this you know, new car payment. Yes, I do still plan on paying it off early, but that's gonna be the last of my consumer debts that I pay because the interest rate on it is lower than my um, other debts that I'm working on. But um, yeah, just some more food for thought for you going into this work week. Um, there is very little nowadays that we need to buy new. So if you're thinking that you need something, you got to add something into your life, then heavily consider whether or not You've got to go out and pay full retail for the newest, latest, greatest thing that's going to be replaced in a short amount of time and be outdated in a short amount of time. Or whether it would be better to pay a significant amount less and get um, a slightly used, slightly older model of the thing that you're wanting. All right, y'all. Thank you for watching as always. If you have not already, please subscribe. I'd love to have you part of my YouTube fam. And I'll see y'all in the next one. Bye.